welcome to the Business Leadership Series, where we engage with leaders who are making an impact on their worlds and who want to share their knowledge and experience for your personal and professional growth. The following interview is designed to inspire you to become the best leader you can be. Your host, Derek Champagne, is the founder and CEO of The Artist Evolution, a full-service agency building successful brands, marketing tools, and campaigns, and also the author of the best-selling book, Don't Buy a Duck. And now, let's begin today's Leadership Series interview. Welcome to the Business Leadership Series, where our goal is to inspire you to become the best leader that you can be. I'm excited to have our guest today, Jack Daly. Many of you know him. He's a leading sales speaker and trainer, over 30 years of sales and executive experience. His track record is a testament to his real-world knowledge and extensive expertise in sales and sales management. Uh, he started his professional journey at a CPA firm, Arthur Anderson, rose to the CEO level of several corporations, built six companies into national firms along the way, two of which he sold to the Wall Street firms of Solomon Brothers and also to First Boston, and is the author of many books, but the one we're going to uh, feature today and talk about is Hyper Sales Growth in 2016. Jack, thanks for spending a few minutes with us today. Derek, I'm excited to be here and uh, share with uh, your audience. I first got to see you uh, in, in earlier this year at the Scale Up Conference, was very impressed. We're always looking for edges and for ways to be better leaders, for ways to authentically sell and connect. And it's, the, it's the secret sauce. It's what's missing in some of our organizations and you know mine included, where I spent almost two years just looking for that that holy grail of how do we figure out how to sell this effectively. Probably we're looking at it the wrong way, so you're going to give us insight today. But before we do that, uh, I've, I've read your background and I know about some of your early years of selling and we like to talk to our guests and learn about some of their early days and just kind of what brought them and made them who they are so that we get a better understanding of you. So can you tell us a little bit more about you and, and tell us about some of those early, early days of, of, of when you first started selling? <laughs> if we're going to go back that far, Derek, it's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> so, so my first sales job literally was when I was seven years old. And with the way I like to say it is I own the market and charge twice the price of every kid I competed with. <laughs> uh, and, and let me get there's a there's a tip in here for the for for everybody at every age in terms of selling. And that is uh, I made and sold potholders. And um, the only people that sold, made and sold potholders back then were little girls. And the market uh, was moms and grandmoms. And um, and they were easy to make. And so I just saw an opportunity there and I would knock on the doors of moms and grandmoms and say, hey, I, I made this potholder and the, I'm, I'm trying to sell it. And uh, and the mom and grandmom would say, well, I, I bought I bought a lot of potholders already from Mary and Sally and Susie. And I'm like, yeah, I, I get that. They're all little girls, though. You've never bought a potholder made by a little boy. And I know that for a fact because I'm the only little boy that sells them. So would you like mm. one or two? And <laughs> um. And so the girls had to share the market amongst themselves. I own the market. And when you own the market, you can charge whatever you want. I charged twice the price of everybody I competed with, and everybody had a potholder made by Jack Daly. I fell in love with sales then. I moved on at 12 years old. I took a newspaper route of 32 customers, and uh, 12 months later, it was 275 customers. Hmm. I didn't want to deliver 275 papers, so I hired five kids to couldn't get the newspaper out because they weren't old enough. I shared the money 50-50 with them. I kept the tips, which is where all the money was, and, <laughs> um, and, and, went on, and went on with the rest of my life. So I have been in the game for many, many decades. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I, I love how you own the market. That's, that's, that's everything. That's a big deal. Tell me, let's, let's take one more, one more jog in memory lane. At 13, uh, tell me about personally interviewing many adults uh, to design your life because yeah. I waited, I think I waited till I was like 30 to do that. So you, you, you're way ahead of me. Yeah. Well, here, here's the thing. Uh, while these kids were delivering my papers for me, I got time on my hands. So I ended up becoming a caddy at a cr country club. I'm the oldest of five kids. And my dad was not a member of a country club. He worked six days a week just to feed and put clothes on our back. And, uh, I'm, I'm out there at the golf course. I think I know the job, carry the bag, rake the traps, tend the pin. But all of a sudden, I'm realizing these guys are driving really, really recent, vintage, nice upscale cars. They're playing golf during the week and the weekend, and they live in big estate homes. 
and the light bulb went on me and I said, man, if I had a choice, would I rather live the life my dad's living or live the life that these guys are living? And if I wanted to choose the life that they were living, I couldn't go to my dad and say, how do I do it? Because he never figured it out. Hmm. But if I went to these guys and said, I want to go by your office and interview you, I probably can't get through the gatekeeper. But they came to my office. It was called the golf course. And I would sit, I would stand next to them and walk 18 holes over a four-hour period of time and I'm pummeling them with questions. How did you become successful? What would you do different? What would you tell a 13-year-old? And I just hammered that away. And uh, I heard a lot of, of similar threads running through uh, how they got to be where they were. And I want to tell you, this is really funny. If I did that to you today, and when you finished your round, you probably go in the clubhouse for a beer and see a buddy of yours and say, hey, have you ever had that daily kid carry your bag? <laughs> oh, shit, did he ask you the questions? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I had 200 uh, members of the country club take a vested interest in my, me as a as a future entrepreneur. Wow, that's in, that's impressive. I'm curious, did you realize back then how special that and, and coveted that time was? Uh, or, or were you just no fearless? Idea. It, it was it was it, it just seemed completely natural and normal. Yeah. I would have thought that anyone would have done it. And it wasn't until I was in my 30s when people that were adults said, who gave you that idea or where yeah. did you, you know, that type of thing. And I'm like, I, I, what are you talking about? It just doesn't that make sense. And they're going, yeah, it makes sense. But uh, I'm not aware of anybody else that would have done that. Right. Incredible. Yeah, that's that's it's great advice to remember now. And, you know, when we talk about the categories of mentorship, which we, we're not going to go into too much today, but a lot of times there there is access to that person that has the information, the knowledge that you want. If you catch them at the right place in the right time and if you're in the right place uh, in, in your life as well to ask the right questions and, and be a good student. So I, I, Derek, I love that you I, did I, that. I, I'll tell you, uh, I, I have a term for it. I call it model the masters. Hmm. And and I say, you know, to my audiences, uh, if you want to do anything in life uh, and you want to do it at an exceptional high level, figure out the people that have already done it and go to them and say, how do you do it? <laughs> you got to get your ego out of the way and you got to find a way to get in the in the room with them. But what I found interesting is that I I love the guys that come after me at, for 30 minutes of my time, 60 minutes of my time, because they have ambition and they have the gravitas to ask. Right. Um, you know, I just don't find many successful people that turn people down that have the initiative to do that. Hmm. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I, I want to talk about principles from your book because we've got, got a few minutes with you. Hyper sales growth in 2016. Can you give, give us some highlights? Like when, what can the reader expect? What are some big aha takeaways uh, when they sit down with this book? Yeah, so the book is actually written in three distinct groupings. Um, the first grouping is on the big, big picture of what does an entrepreneur really need to spend their time on uh, that'll give us the, the best leverage, the highest return for their investment of their time. Um, that's, that's, that's on the big picture and creating a winning culture in the company. The second part of the book is on sales management which is all about recruiting, training, coaching, building, and developing out of the sales force. And in most businesses, if you want to grow your company, grow your sales force in quantity and quality, and that's all about sales management. And then the third part of the book is for salespeople, the proven systems and processes that will enable a salesperson to win new customers and grow the ones you have and differentiate yourself from the competition. And by the end of the book, which is a relatively short book of a couple hundred pages, uh, we don't we don't spend a lot of time on theory. It's real world, mm. easy, implementable things that work. Yeah, that's that's everything you talk about spending your time. I, I can't think of a more valuable asset for, for an entrepreneur, for someone growing a company than than figuring out where the time goes and how to spend uh, it most effectively. Here, here, here's here's the deal. Everyone starts the week the same number of hours, one hundred and sixty eight. Now, that's a mathematically given number. It's seven times 24, right? Hmm. But it's but it's bogus because we know we got to sleep. So if you do eight hours times seven, it's 56. And we just got down to near 100. And then we got to eat. 
and then you should exercise and then you got some stuff with your family and by and large when you start to subtract all the other things out of the week that are that are mandatory they're 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 not a discretion uh, what you end up with is somewhere between 40 and 60 hours that you can effectively employ in whatever it is that's going to get you closer to success so the question then becomes are you nailing that 40 to 60 on what i call the high payoff activities towards what your definition of success is mm. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. I want to talk for just a minute about the salespeople. I know you, you give advice to salespeople, but since I have the guru uh, on the line right now, I don't want to waste this opportunity. Uh, you know, in our own organization, we find challenges with finding the right salespeople. Do you have any top of mind tips or tried and true of, of what an organization should look for with their, with the right kind of person that can sell their product? Yeah. So, uh, so I do. No surprise. Uh, and, and in fact, if you, if the audience were to have an interest, they could go and subscribe to, uh, free to my YouTube videos. I've got over 300 that are sitting out there. I'm a runner uh, mm. that I do. You know, I, I've, I've logged 95 marathons in my life and I have one coming up in uh, Havana, Cuba in a couple of weeks. But but uh, I when I run, I run with my uh, phone and uh, the uh, endorphins kick in. And then all of a sudden, uh, I'll just have some you know, defining moment and do a two or three minute video. And that's how I've accumulated all these videos. Um, the, the, one of the videos that's sitting out there on YouTube by me is what is the single most important ingredient for a salesperson to be successful? And I did it in London with um, Winston Churchill statue standing behind me. <laughs> and basically, I said, it's one word, G-R-I-T, grit. Um, the ability to get up after you've been knocked down. Um, mm. it's, 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 the, it's the grit, it's the tenacity, it's the commitment to the end zone. It doesn't matter how many no's you get, um, as long as you pursue it with passion and you're driven towards that end zone. Um, I can teach you product, I can teach you price, I can teach you service, I can teach you strategies, I can teach you tactics. I can teach anybody any of those things but if they don't have grit, they won't cut it as a salesperson. Hmm. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's, that's and, and by the important. way, I don't know how to teach grit. I don't know how to teach somebody to get up every morning and want to chew raw meat off the bone. Right. But, yeah. but, but if you take the kid that was six out there doing potholders, and you take the kid that was 12 and doing newspapers, and you take the kid that is 13 and interviewed 200 people at the country club, um, you know, success lose, leaves clues. There's patterns. And so if you've had success early in your life, arguably you're going to have success later on in your life. You know, I, 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 I was a trained accountant working for what was back then known as a big eight firm. Uh, I was a captain in the United States Army. Uh, I, 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 I built a half a dozen businesses and now I'm in the top one percent of professional speakers and have had three number one best selling books on Amazon in three consecutive years. Uh, all, all of those disciplines I just, uh, just articulated are very different from one another, and yet we're, uh, I, I achieved at an optimal level. Uh, one of the key ingredients is I, I am driven, I have grit, and I have a vision of where I want to go, and nothing will get in my way. Hmm. So, uh, couldn't agree with you more. How do you how do you look for those things? Are you looking for some of those intangibles like you've seen in yourself when you're doing an interview more yeah, than just so, seeing a resume? Yeah. So, so one of my favorite questions is give me one or two success stories from your past. It's a little right. bit like you started this, this dialogue today. Give me one or two stories from your, from your success stories from your past. Now the interviewee will typically go to where, something on the resume and I stop them cold and say, I can read your resume anytime. Give me something before your resume. And now I've taken the guy out of his normal place. Um, he's got to start to think about it. And if, if you did that to me and I dropped the potholder in a newspaper story on you, um, you already figured out that I've got the grit. And mm -hmm. as long as you've got the system and process and can teach me what the product and service is, uh, I'm ready to go. Suit me up and put me out there. Yeah, wow. Hey, I want to talk about your uh, away from the book for a minute, but I want to talk about your bucket list. You have it, uh, you have it out there. Uh, to, uh, I've got a link to it. Tell me about how important it is to have a bucket list and what drives you. you. You do with related to athletics and travel, and you've got your bucket list out there. Tell me more about that. 
Yeah, when you say we got it out there, Derek, it's on my website at, at jackdaily.net. Uh, and uh, it's over 300 items. I'm regularly adding items to it. I just put another 15 on a list to get to the computer and update it again. Um, it's got some very, very big items on it. And it also has some kind of easy type of items on it. Uh, I, you know, a, a big item might be run a marathon in all 50 states. Uh, that's one of over 300 items on on the on there. That that wasn't like somebody that says run a marathon. And I'm not dismissing running a marathon, but mm. you run one, you get to check the box. I got to go to 50 states, which I've now done. <laughs> run a marathon in all the continents. Well, that's another task. Run, play the top hundred golf courses, of which I've got 95 completed. Uh, but here is the message that I want to convey, and 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 there's there, there's stuff out there that I haven't done. Seventy six percent of my bucket list is now complete hmm. as it stands today. But as I said, we'll continue to add items. But you know, I've got items like uh, meet a president in the in the Oval Office. I have uh, to be a, a passenger on Air Force One. Uh, I have uh, I want to run with the Olympic torch uh, in an in an Olympics. Uh, you know, these are these are these are things that people would view as well. That, that, that that's you're just living in a fantasy world. But but I've had I have three people now that have come to me and said uh, I can I can get you to torch. Uh, mm. What what Olympics do you want to go? But here's the message: if you don't know where you want to go, and if you don't share with the world as you see the world, if you don't let let it get out there, um, then it's impossible for people to help you. Right. Uh, that, you know, I've, I've played 95 of the top 100 golf courses, but I'm in uh, my audiences are filled with CEOs, and I somehow mention that I'm trying to do that. And guys come up to me at the break with their business card and say, hey, if you haven't played this one, I can get you on. But they can't help me get on if I haven't broadcast it out there. Right. Right. And, and, and so there's so many things that I have accomplished on my bucket list because people came out of the woodwork to help. So, you know, I, I put on there that I wanted to fl fly a, a fighter jet, right? And <laughs> uh, literally, a guy calls me up and says, I saw on your bucket list, you want to fly a fighter jet? Is, is that done yet? And I said, no. And he sends me an email and says, with a photo and says, I, I bought this from the U.S. Air Force. It's a fighter jet. Does this qualify? I'm going, holy crap, you bet. <laughs> And we never had met until he landed his plane in Los Angeles and he got out of the cockpit, shook my hand, handed me a helmet and said, get behind me. And we're going to go up and off I went. And then after doing acrobatics in a fighter jet plane, he then in, in, in the helmet speaks to me and says, are you ready? And I'm going ready. I, that was unbelievable. <laughs> what are you asking me? And he said, well, you said you wanted to fly it. I'm about to give you the controls. Wow. Wow. <laughs> that's incredible. Well, you've got me, you've got me fired up right now. That's, that's incredible. It's so, so give me for those listening. I mean, I understand having a vision and putting it out there. That makes sense. Here's my question though. Is what, what makes a bucket list is anything that pops in your head? What just, uh, just my personal curiosity. Cause I want to do this as well. Uh, I get having a clear vision. So others around, you know, how they can help you get there and, 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 and how they can support you. What makes a bucket list? Yeah. So, so, so uh, how, how about this? You can go uh, on your web browser and just punch in bucket list and the world will give you all kinds of items that are on the world's bucket list. People just throwing stuff out there. Right. Mm. So, so when I started to get close, to, I was over 90% complete on the bucket list. You don't want to complete the bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a good thing. That's great advice. <laughs> so, so I started adding stuff that's kind of farcical, like uh, shear a sheep, okay? Or, <laughs> or by the way, I'm shearing a sheep in the first quarter of 2020. It's already scheduled. <laughs> uh, I'm doing it. I'm doing it in Texas. Wow. Uh, but I had four people from three different countries to help suggest they could help me shear a sheep. <laughs> uh, I, I've done the segue, uh, and I, I I met a guy that it was in uh, Calgary, Canada. And uh, he said, I, I hear you're coming to Calgary. Uh, I see that on your bucket list, you, you've got Segway. Can, can I take him on a tour of the city on a Segway? And I said, great. 
that guy ended up becoming a coach client of mine that I have been coaching for over a year now. Wow. Uh, and, and, you know, and so it's, it was business development and a friendship and on and on and on. So there's little tiny things and there's big, big things. And then there's things on there that maybe somebody would suggest you really lost it at 28 <laughs> years old at 28 years old. I put on my bucket list and you can see it on, on my website right now. It says I'm going to live to 125. Okay. Wow. Now when I put that on at 28 years old. People thought I was completely zonkers. Um, and, and, uh, and 10 years ago, people were telling me I was out to lunch, but now they're starting to see some of the written material on the advances in medical science that suggests that people are going to live past a hundred and there's going to be a fair number of them. Mm. Here's what my, here's what my thinking was back that back when I was 28, I said that if I could live a, 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 a proper lifestyle, uh, uh, for example, uh, take care of myself fitness wise. And I've always been fit and I'm, I, I prioritize exercise. Um, I have regular appointments with all of my doctors, whether it's dentist or eyes or skin uh, or, or regular uh, uh, medical. Uh, all of those are preformed and in the calendar, non-negotiable. Hmm. They're, they're scheduled always. Uh, I, I've, I've never smoked. Uh, I've never done drugs. I've never had a cup of coffee. Uh, mm. and, 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 and I said, if between 28 and 75, I could live a life that was like that, uh, then by the age of 75, medical science would figure out how to take me to 125. But I, if I handed them a broken down 75 year old man, then they don't want to inject the science. Mm -hmm. So two years ago, I was 68 years old. And at 68 years old, I had my doctors test me on anything and everything that they could do to see what condition I was in. The three of them and myself got around the round table and we went through all of the results. And two years ago, I was declared the equivalent of a 39 year old male. at wow. 68. Incredible. So but but it, it, I, I'm not it, it, uh, it's not a matter of getting lucky. It, it, it's deciding, you know, what is success to you? What do you want? What's your vision? And, and then backloading it, just to, just reverse engineer it. What do I need to do differently? I grew up in in the 60s, sex, drugs and rock and roll. Right. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I, I don't I didn't belong to a fraternity. I, I belong to the Quezon Club, which means you're in ROTC getting ready to go into the military. Mm. And this is during the time that we are in Vietnam. OK, mm. <laughs> but but if I can stay uh, within the military confines of discipline and rigor and all of those types of things, as opposed to joining the fraternity and dropping a whole bunch of stuff inside me that's not going to be good for my health in the long term, that just made a lot of sense to me. Well, and your motto is to live your life by design. I love that. Um, you know, you've got, I didn't mention you were captain in the U.S. Army as well, which is, I believe, probably a big contributor to, to you. Tell me what influence that had on your life and, and your discipline. Yeah, so four years of ROTC, uh, and I, I can tell you, sitting here today, I have a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and all of the all of the courses that I took in school. If I were to look back today, I would tell you the ones that had the most impact and relevancy for me as a human going forward uh, were the ones that I had in the military ROTC program. Mm. Any final things you want to share with us, Jack? And I'm going to plug your website and your book again. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, if, if we've got entrepreneurs listening, uh, uh, here's my message. They're, they're too involved in the day-to-day, -day, uh, and you've got to delegate and empower your people to execute uh, the three things that I want my entrepreneurs that I coach, uh, the three things I want them to spend the lion's share of their time on is the clarity of the vision. I can't get there unless I know what there is. Putting key people in key spots and being deliberate about who those people are, holding them accountable, and under, understanding as the company grows, they probably won't be the right key people as the company grows. And we, I understand that's tough, but that's what the CEO entrepreneur's job is. And the third piece is, um, you know, get the culture right. Peter Drucker said, uh, culture eat strategy for breakfast. He was absolutely spot on. If I can create an environment where the people who work in my company look forward every day to coming in and kicking ass and having fun, then we got clarity on the vision. Um, nothing's going to stop you. Mm, 
clarity of vision, key people in the key spots, getting your culture right. Jack Daly talking to us about living a life by design. Uh, also uh, talking about his book, Hyper Sales Growth in 2016, with, with three groupings of what to spend your time on, uh, key focus on sales management and how to do that, and then also a section for your salespeople directly as well to help them. Uh, Jack, thank you so much. JackDaily.net to see uh, more content from him. Look at look for Jack Daily. Also, uh, his videos. He's got hundreds of videos. Jack, thank you so much for spending time. It was a pleasure to get to learn from you today. Total fun, Derek. Thank you. We'll talk soon. Thanks. You've been listening to the Business Leadership Series, where we engage with leaders who are making an impact on their worlds and who want to share their knowledge and experience for your personal and professional growth. This interview was designed to inspire you to become the best leader you can be. 